Welcome to this episode of Cinema Crunch. My name is Rose Donahue, and we are filming at the Quantum Arc Media Studio in Las Vegas, Nevada. There are a lot of precautions on set to keep everybody safe, but what happens if the worst should happen? In that moment, you would be very glad to have an on-set medic ready to jump in and take action. Today, I'll be talking about that position with CEO and Operations Chief of Guardian Elite Medical Services, Sam Scheller and Orvis Slack. Thanks for joining me today, you guys. No problem. How's it going? Doing great. Doing great. Well, I'm glad you're here because set safety, I think, is one of those things people don't think about right away. Kind of like walking out your door in the morning. You don't think about what hazards could come up. So what are some of the things that you guys do to prepare before going on set? Well, one thing I would like to do is echo what you said of not preparing. We get a lot of last minute day before requests. So it's definitely mm. one of those things <laughs> that many times is, is people don't even think about. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I, even we get last minute requests for camera operators. And you would think <laughs> if you're filming something, you'll want a camera operator booked really ahead of time. But um, it's kind of the nature of the industry. So do you guys just have like cars ready to go out when it's time? Pretty much it's just on call. When somebody calls up, we'll actually staff somebody to actually go out. Um, the biggest thing, like you said, is that people don't really kind of put that in their mindset when they're actually trying to order services or something like that. They come from L.A. or another area, and they arrive here, and they're like, oh, crap, we need to hire a medic. And they start searching around, and we're primary the first one that usually shows up on any kind of search engine or anybody who actually is trying to find a safety set medic or somebody on site. And we're the first that usually gets the call. Well, that's a good place to be oh, yeah. for you guys. Yeah. Um, I saw that you guys have a lot of like different options, uh, ambulances, rescue squads, disaster trailers, um, a Kawasaki mule, and an EMS and EMS bikers. I was curious what a Kawasaki mule is. So the Kawasaki mule is a custom-built, one-of-a-kind, actual uh, ATV or all-terrain vehicle that was something that I came up with a few years ago when we were talking about upgrading our old fleet and trying to find something new. And we spent a few days looking around trying to find something, and um, the Kawasaki mule was probably the best purchase that we actually found. It was an all-steel body frame. Um, and we were looking for something to be able to do dual role. We wanted to be able to do... Uh, in city jurisdiction kind of doing stuff on sidewalks and streets and stuff like that but we also wanted the capability of four-wheel drive being able to go out into the brush or valley of fire or lake mead or something like that so we we looked around and we found the Kawasaki mule was probably the best thing that we looked at and then I sat down took a couple days to kind of sketch out what I wanted in my head and what I wanted to kind of put together on it and then we took it across our way from our shop and had one of the body guys over there. I'm like, this is what I want. I want something custom built, something one of a kind. And it took about a month to put it together, but it is pretty pretty bad. Cool. It is. It's, uh, we've used it for Life is Beautiful. We've used it for many events out at Lake Mead. Uh, just recently we were out at Mwapa for the Fortune Life Festival using it out there. And it has a dual purpose. It can, like I said, it can be all terrain or it can be in city use. Uh, set up as capable for putting a gurney uh, out of the ambulance under the back, or we can use a Stokes basket if we're out in the wilderness or something like that. A Stokes basket? Stokes basket is a big metal frame basket that uh, if somebody's hiking or gets hurt out in the wilderness, we can actually take the basket out, put them in that, load uh, them up, and then oh. put them back into the actual Kawasaki. A human-sized basket. Yes. yes. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> Got it's it. Not like a little Easter basket. <laughs> yeah. Got it. Very cool. Okay, so it's an ATV. Oh, that's what I was curious about. I was like, not really familiar, but love that. So um, I imagine, ideally, every film set or live event would have medics. <laughs> I imagine that that doesn't happen. <laughs> are there kind of are there some projects where you're like, you guys should really have a medic here All compared the time. just always. All the time. Yeah, and we'll hear about productions or something coming to the area. And we'll scratch our heads and go, why haven't they hired somebody? Mm -hmm. Or what they'll do is they'll try to bring somebody out of state or out of the area and they're not used to our protocols or the rules or regulations that are actually here in Nevada. And 
yeah, we, we run through that a lot where mm. they'll hire somebody who's just fresh out of school with no experience and basically say, oh, now you're a set medic and they'll put them on a location and oh, man. they're kind of clueless when it comes to actually dealing with situations. So it happens. And unfortunately, people just think that they can kind of come into the area and do what they want to do because they're hired out of L.A. or they're hired mm. out of another area. And it kind of makes things harder for us because when we hear about it, we can't have any enforcement. We can't really call up and say, hey, you need to hire somebody local. Mm. Um, there's no governing rules or regulations that actually can abide by that, that we can actually use that enforcement. And mm. unfortunately, that's, that's the way it is. And California is a way different that you can actually pull the trigger and say, hey, you know what? This is the rules. These are the regulations. This uh. is the law. Nevada but just here, doesn't have that policy have and procedure. There's no in infrastructure place in place or anything like that. Mm. And we've we brought it to uh, the film commission and a lot of other agencies about it and, and say, hey, you know what? These are things that we should talk about and bring to to light. And unfortunately, it's so low on the totem pole that they don't really want to talk about it mm. until somebody gets hurt or somebody dies. They don't really care. Right. Mm. Mm, that is bleak. That is unfortunate. Um, so let's move on to a slightly lighter note. How can you tell if someone is acting or actually hurt? <laughs> <laughs> um, there are some tail signs you can actually tell if somebody is actually faking it. or And it's kind of like, what's the reason behind it? The first thing you walk up and... And me and him both have this kind of standoff attitude. When we walk into a room, we kind of, we're trained to kind of do the scene survey and watch and look at everything that's going on before we actually approach the patient and, and kind of get a general impression of what's going on before we make contact with that person. And you can kind of tell real quick, real fast, if somebody's having some sort of little issue going on or it's an actual true emergency from that point on. So it's part of our training that, that's instilled into us from the beginning when we started doing all this, mm -hmm. that you get kind of taught to focus on what's real and what's kind of bogus. And I guess the more experience you have on set, the more you'll know the uh, difference. All the time, yeah. yeah. And that's that's the thing. And a lot of our, uh, our people that we train in-house that actually we put out on locations and stuff like that, we kind of train them to look for things to kind of key in on if somebody looks like they're feeling sick or they might be a little dehydrated or mm. whatever kind of signs and symptoms going on. We kind of gear them to say, hey, keep an eye out for certain things like this, and it'll tell you. And honestly, most people don't want to fake being on and being sick. I've had right. extras that have done stupid things where they're like, oh, well, I don't want to be here. I'm not getting paid a lot of money, and they'll fake out being sick. And it's like, well, go home then. Yeah. No reason for you to be here if, if that's the way you want to be there's the door mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you guys prepare for when you are on a truly hazardous set like if they're doing a practical explosion usually the night before it's mostly me that will prepare all the equipment if we're going to take out the rescue and the fire suppression and stuff like that I'll prep everything and have it all ready to go for the morning of and then we'll actually load up and take off and go to the set and yeah, it's usually meeting with a coordinator or like George Phillip, who's a special effects guy. We'll meet with him and kind of go over and what needs mm. to be in place and how we're going to do it and where are going to be the explosions and yeah. how far do we need to keep people back. And, and it's just our safety job. It's just making sure that everybody's safe and healthy on the production. And that's, that's our number one goal is just making right. sure everybody kind of plays by the rules and they stay healthy and safe while they're filming. Right. And that is an important aspect of production. You guys are there to keep everybody safe, but it's not your job to be stunt coordinators. Those are different no. jobs for a reason because you guys have different things to focus on, just like it's not the stunt coordinator's job to provide emergency care. Yeah. Right? I mean, really, I think what it is is, you know, the stunt coordinator is there to take a look at the stunt and make sure the stunt happens safely. We're there to watch the stunt coordinator make sure the stunt coordinator itself is being safe. That makes That's a very concise way to put it. That makes a lot of sense. That's really cool. Um, and how would... How did you, uh, Sam, decide to get into the production field after your experience in medical? Production's been something that I've always kind of been part of. Uh, my mother was the original mime on Sesame Street. Oh, cool. So I've, <laughs> I've kind of grown up with, uh, you know, with production. Um, and so I, I've always, you know, filmed and I, I have, you know, small little production company that we always enter in 40-hour mm -hmm. film festivals and things like that. So 
Uh, it just kind of fell hand in hand, uh, becoming a paramedic, and then ultimately opening up Guardian Elite Medical Services. And then from there, uh, just by the nature of what we did, by providing EMTs and paramedics to special events, we kind of viewed a set as a you know one day kind of or multi day special event. Um, so it kind of went hand in hand, and then from there it just kind of blossomed into the multiple things that we do. So between all of our vehicle rentals, our on site medical coverage, uh, radio rentals, I mean all the all the stuff that we yeah do, you guys have kinda, yeah kinda, stockpile yeah. of <laughs> medical things, which is great. I was curious about the car rentals. Are there is there some licensing you have to do? Because you guys have a cop car and you have a fire engine, all this stuff. How do the real police, well, I guess you guys, well, you're not police, you're medics. How do people know what is a on-set prop car and a actual official police yeah, and fire we're, car? Yeah, we're very particular in who we lend the cop car to. Uh, one of the things is that we don't ever leave it unattended, so it's always monitored by one of our staff members. So in that way, it doesn't leave set you know, yeah. in, unintentionally. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and so true. that's yeah, something that we're very cautious about. Um, but we don't have any uh, real decals on it. So you know, if we were to have a client that wanted, let's say, a Metro cop car, we would do a similar looking logo, but enough that you could tell it apart so that mm-hmm. you know it's not police. Um, we don't go just driving around town just free, you know, right. free driving. Uh, yeah, you know, we, we have a cop car. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, that sounds like a good standard safety decision. You'd be yeah. surprised. Have... People call up all the time. Uh, hey, I want to use this for a bachelor party, or I want to trick my buddy. Or oh. it's it's ridiculous some of the stuff that we get called for and. Unfortunately, people don't really understand when we rent it out, there are certain liabilities and issues about it. We don't rent it out to everybody. And we've had people call up and say, hey, we want to do a rap video or something. Mm. And like, hey, you have to go through the process. You have to pay for the permit. You have to pay for the insurance and everything that's required on it. And a lot of times people are like, ah, well, no. We, we just want to do this one rap video. We want one scene with the cop car in the background. Right. And, and what are you going to do with the car? Oh, we're going to stand on it and jump up and down. We're going to hit it with a bat or something like that. And I'm like, no, it's <laughs> not going to happen. Right, 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 so, right. And that, the cop car itself was something, too. That was another project that Sam kind of threw in my plate and said, hey, we got this car. And it showed up basically just everything shoved in the trunk. And I had about a month to put it together. And we created the only one that's actually around. I know there's a few other guys here in town that have a couple of them. But we kind of follow strict standards. We were very particular on who we rented out to. Yeah. And we actually have to have insurance. They have to have liability to be able to cover it if we are going to rent it. For sure. Um, and then, like Sam says, we actually sent somebody out who stays with it for the duration of the time that's on rental. Yeah. And it's been out on some a lot of Chinese feature productions. There's been a lot of times it's been out on that along with the fire truck. Um, so it's made a lot of appearances around Vegas. Doing very kind of famous stuff. cop car. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. I think that that comes up even uh, for some clients that come to us sometimes in terms of not having a full understanding of the importance of permitting and insurance and all of that stuff. So uh, that's kind of across the production field with people who are who are new to the industry. Um, so it makes it's. I hadn't thought much about the parallels of renting a cop car and hiring <laughs> video production <laughs> services, but they're definitely there. That's awesome. So. Um, what are some things that like anybody on set can do to make it a safer space? For me, the biggest one, drink plenty of water. We are in Las Vegas. It is hot. doesn't matter what time of year it is. Drink plenty of water. I think that's probably the majority of what we see on set is people who are just dehydrated. Yeah. And when we get the outside sets that are actually like Valley of Fire or oh, yeah. Red Rock or something like that, stay in your area. Don't wander around mm. with snakes and scorpions and spiders and bugs and things that people yeah, don't so think about. Don't it. play with the wildlife. <laughs> yeah, don't eat the cactus. We've had, we've had that yeah. where an actor was kind of like challenged, hey, take a bite out of the cactus. And he had no. thorns in his tongue no. and he had to pull them all out. <laughs> so it's Yikes. just... Yikes. Stay in your area, stay hydrated, um, know what the rules are, yeah. yeah. Especially like no smoking. If you're in a, a area where there's a lot of foliage and brush and stuff like that, don't smoke. And there's signs posted and yeah. people just don't really rely on that. They're like, well, I smoke all the time, I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do. And right. We had that happen in a, a farming building, which was all dry hay and just brush and oh, woods and everything else. Gosh. And this person was lighting up smoking and we're like, wait a minute, dude, you know where you're at? Yeah. Ah. And we had to have the fire marshal step in and kind of go, dude. Really, though? Yeah. No smoking right no now. Smoking. Yeah, really, though. Yeah. yeah, I mean, especially here uh, throughout California, it's just dry, dry. 
dry. And I mean, that's true a lot of places. Even in the Northeast, it might be a more humid space, but if there's dry brush around, anything yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So when you are on sets or uh, working on live events, we do video production for live events as well. So I feel like we might have some overlap with their experiences there as well. Um, do you do you find that the highest risk of injury is kind of backstage or in production with all the heavy gear or with audience members, with guests, um, with, you know, extras and stuff like that, kind of the outside, slightly outside of production or outside of the live event crowd? I think if you take a look at it, depending on how you look at the numbers, right? So if you have an event with, let's say, 50,000 people, right? Mm. You're going to have a certain number of your participants that are injured, right? Mm. So just based on that, we can say that, yeah, obviously the, the participants are going to be, you know, have a higher injury rate than, than the crew. But I think we need to look at it at a per capita rate, right? Mm. So at the per capita rate, my experience has been the crew tends to see us a little bit more than, than the crowd just because they're, they're, they're working, they have, you know, they'll end up cutting themselves or having some kind of, you know, minor medical injury, or sometimes they have major medical injuries. Usually with the, with the working group, we see the, like I said, the, the cuts from knives, from opening up boxes or lifting things heavy. Whereas our crowds, we tend to see the people who, you know, pass out in the middle of the crowds and, you know, don't drink plenty of water. So it just depends on kind of how you want to take that question. Interesting. No, that's a good distinction. And I guess depends on the time and space and what's being, what I mean, the event is. Yeah. It, it's, it's really a numbers game. I mm-hmm. mean, it's, it's that makes you know, sense. If, you have, if you have 100 crew members working an event and, uh, you know, 10 of them see you for medical, you got a 10% injury rate, right? But if you have 1,000 people that are attending your event, but only 10 of you, but only 10 of them come to medical, that you have a much lower, you know, per capita. Right. That makes a lot of sense. No, that's a very fine distinction. I'm glad you brought that up. A lot up. of times, we, the crews themselves, we actually see them all the time. If we're working a production that might be a week or two weeks, we become very familiar with them. They know us. They mm-hmm. know where we're at. And we're actually, we see them more often. Um, where the crowds themselves change every day, depending on if it's in a, like a special event or some sort of festival or something like that you have a constant frequent change of people coming in, so you're not seeing the same group of people all the time. Um, and we've seen it at, in some sporting events, we've seen them at some of the bigger festivals and stuff like that, where we get a majority of the actual cast and crew we might be dealing with on a daily basis, but the public we might see once in a while, depending right. on what's going on at the show or the event or what's happening. Very cool, that makes sense. All right, we're getting to our wrapping up time, but I have two last questions. One, we'll start, we'll do one at a time. Um, when you are brought onto a project, who is your point person on set? Usually production manager. Those are the ones who actually contact us out. Um, okay. So when we are booking an event or something like that, we go through the particulars on what are you looking for, a fire safety officer, or are you looking for a set medic? Um, we kind of get the 411 on what the event is, kind of get the information so we can actually scout it out and kind of get a general overview of how big the event, how many people are attending, what are some of the concerns or problems that might come up during the show or during the event. Um, and then we kind of prepare from that, from that point on. But usually the production manager is our point of contact when we arrive on scene. Sometimes the location yeah. manager might help us with kind of last minute figuring stuff out, but the PM or the UPM is usually their first person that we make contact with. Yeah, okay, very cool. I was curious, you guys are very organized, almost military-esque, and ideally sets are kind of set up that way, you know, very top down. So it's nice knowing where everybody fits together. And then my last question is, if someone was interested in becoming an on-set medic, specifically they wanted to work on films or production, how would you suggest that they get into the industry? First thing I'd recommend is going to EMT school. So become a certified EMT. Uh, and then from there, either advanced or paramedic school. Um, we offer an EMT school. And then uh, from there, you could probably take it from it's how It's to get in-house into it. training. It's a lot mm-hmm. of it is, is, is kind of you learn from being in the field. Um, we, we kind of say, hey, you know what? You can't really walk out there and kind of walk the walk or do the talk if you don't have experience or knowledge behind it. And... A lot of the working on film shoots are related from past experiences that we've had on other events or other other things. And it's kind of one of those things that if you're going to train somebody, you need to have somebody who's willing to learn and willing to kind of take that next level or that next step. Um, you can do the basic skills as an EMT, but then there's other little things that people don't think about in the safety aspect or behind that 
um, that kind of comes from years of experience and working in the field. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's very good to know. And I hope that I think that's a useful tidbit of information for anybody listening. Anything else you guys want to share before we wrap up? We're the only company in Clark County that actually has fire safety officers. We actually, oh. myself and Scott Lindstrom is another actual fire trained safety officer. Um, we went to California and spent some time out there with the uh, state fire marshal and Cal Fire and actually went through the training to actually learn to do it. Because they don't really have, they have fire marshals, but they don't have anybody who's particular for filming. And myself okay. and Scott are the only two that actually work for Guardian that are actually here in the county, in Clark County, that are actually licensed and certified to be able to do that. So when you're looking for a production that you want to make sure it's 100% safe, pyrotechnic, special effects, stunts, stuff like that, where the guys will come out and actually give you the clean bill of health on your production and make sure it's legit. Good heads up. So anyone coming to Nevada, Clark County, knows who to call. So yeah. actually, where do they find you guys? And do you have any other resources you guys would like to share uh, about what you guys do? So our website, lasvegasambulance.com, is where we can be uh, reached out, or Facebook, Instagram, Garden Lake Medical Services, or at GemsLV. Um, and then resources. We have a good amount of resources on our website to take a look at in terms of what to prepare for and get ready for a production or any kind of event. Fantastic. Yeah, and Very we're pretty cool. well set in here. So if somebody comes to Vegas and they're looking for just general information, they they're more questions. than welcome to call us. We'll help you guys figure stuff out and point you in the right directions on who you need, what you need to get, stuff like that. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Orvis, and thank you so much, Sam. No really enjoyed having you with us today. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for tuning into this episode of Cinema Crunch. Again, my name is Rose Donahue. And we are filming at the Quantum Arc Media Studio in Las Vegas, Nevada. Catch you next time.